this next award's a, a, a lot of fun and, and, and very appropriate for this meeting. It's the Ramon Margulov Award for Excellence in Education. It's fun because the, this year's recipient, Marianne Moore, is probably one of the nicest people on the planet. Uh, if you've never met Marianne, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice, although she probably doesn't want a whole bunch of groupies. Uh, she, she's, she's well worth uh, meeting. She's, she's a special person. She's uh, been at uh, Wellesley College for about 25 years now, where she's been really involved in, in education at all levels, but particularly the undergraduate level. Um, in her nomination, she was called the very embodiment of a dedicated teacher, uh, one who finds ways to enhance her students' ability for critical thinking. And, and this is so important for us because this is the next generation uh, of our colleagues. She's taught levels, uh, or taught, taught courses at all levels of, of the educational program, including introductory courses, which are, can be very transformative because if you turn people on at that level, it makes a difference for them for the rest of their life. But she's best known for a course that she put together with a colleague in the department, uh, uh, Russian department, on Lake Baikal, the soul of Siberia, in which she's brought students, exchange students, from Russia, the Baikal region, to the United States to study, and she's developed now a, a, a reciprocal arrangement that American students can, can go and study Baikal as well. For this alone, uh, her innovation is, is remarkable. She's also, though, received two teaching awards at, at her college, but I think the proof in, is in the pudding, and so I'll just finish my introduction with a quote from, from one of her students. Over the past 10 years, Marianne Moore has been my teacher, mentor, model, and friend. For this, I am extraordinarily fortunate. Marianne's always made me feel comfortable sharing my challenges and my hopes. I've never had any doubt that she cares about me, not only as a student, but as a person, and that she wants me to succeed. Her contributions to my personal, professional, and academic trajectory over the years have been invaluable, and they made me hope that I can give as much to others as she's given to me. So with that, please welcome Marianne Moore, the 2015 Ramon Margulov Awardee for Excellence in Education. I'm going to do something unusual here. Peter, can you help me mm -hmm. here? Yep, set it right there and you can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for those lovely words. And thank you, Aslo. I am deeply honored to have received this award and quite frankly flabbergasted. I share this award with many people. Uh, I received this award largely because of a course I teach at Lake Baikal in Siberia, and many people help with that course and the many research opportunities that have spun off of it. So before, before we, let's see, could, could I have my first slide? <laughs> How do we get that up there? Thank you. Th thank you. So before we explore Ramon Margalef and bridging the salty divide, I want to thank the people with whom I share this award. First, Tom Hodge. Professor Hodge of the Russian Department at Wellesley College co-founded our By Call course with me 15 years ago. His impeccable Russian, deep knowledge of Russian culture and his love for fishing makes him an ideal colleague. I'm grateful to the other wonderful members of the Wellesley College Russian Department who have taught this course with me over the years. In Russia, I thank my two colleagues and friends from Irkutsk State University, Dr. Lubov Izmestyeva, a limnologist who welcomed Tom Hodge and me in August of 2000 when we were still Siberian rookies. In addition to hosting us and our students over the years, she shared two extraordinary data sets for the lake collected by her, her family, friends, and, and colleagues. 
as she, my U.S. colleagues, and myself continue to analyze and publish from these data. I'm grateful to Professor Zhenya Zeloff for sharing his vast knowledge of Lake Baikal with me and my students. And Professor Zeloff is here at the conference today. Uh, I urge you to introduce yourself to him. I also wish to thank the, the staff at the Baikal Biostation who have welcomed and cared for my students and colleagues over the years. Now, these Russian experts and others have taught me and my students a great deal about the lake's ecology, the surrounding terrestrial ecology, the cultural practices of the indigenous peoples, and the conservation efforts of local Russians. Another Baikal limnologist, uh, Professor Oleg Tomoshkin from Russia's Limnological Institute, is also here with us today. And again, I encourage you to introduce yourself to him. I also thank these Russian students and Russian translators who enriched our course and the experience of my students enormously. Some of these brave Russian souls came to the U.S. to participate in the summer research program of my home institution. Now, my Wellesley College students, who voluntarily exiled themselves to Siberia for a month in summer to conduct original research, they warrant special acknowledgement. And finally, my U.S. research collaborators on the Baikal Biodiversity Project. Together, we are exploring how environmental change will affect endemic versus cosmopolitan plankton species in Lake Baikal. I'm indebted to each of them and also to Dr. Ted Ozersky, one of the former postdocs on this project, whose efforts expanded our work and that of my students to include the Baikal seal. Now, as Peter explained, the Excellence for Education Award is in honor of Dr. Ramon Margalef, a brilliant Spanish scientist and educator whose broad interests and curiosity allowed him to bridge the salty divide. He worked very successfully in both freshwater and, and marine systems. I would love to have visited Lake Baikal with Professor Margalef to hear his insights about the structure and function of this great lake, a lake that functions more like an ocean than a lake. And let me show you how, in multiple ways, Lake Baikal functions like an ocean. And first, let's go to Lake Baikal. It's located in south-central Siberia, and its watershed is depicted in white here. Now, you probably all know that this lake is the planet's oldest, deepest, and largest lake by volume, containing more water than all of the North American Great Lakes combined. And I believe you also know it contains more species than any other lake in the world, with more than 80% of the animal, animal species and about 30% of the plant species being endemic. What you may not know is that one of the factors promoting and sustaining the high species richness in this lake is dissolved oxygen. Like in the oceans, oxygen is present in Baikal down to the lake's deepest depths. And Baikal is the only deep lake in the world, by deep I mean deeper than 800 meters, with oxygenated bottom waters. And here's data showing this. Outlined in red, you see a graph of three oxygen depth profiles, one for each of the lake's three basins. Now, oxygen is plotted on the, on the x-axis, increasing to the right, and of course, depth is on the y-axis, beginning at the surface, extending down to 1.6 kilometers. Now, there are three profiles there, one for each of the lake's three basins, and I want you to focus on the oxygen concentration at the bottom of these profiles. It ranges from 10 to 10 and a half milligrams per liter, just extraordinarily high. Lake Tanganyika, another very deep lake, goes anoxic below 300 meters because that is the maximum depth of wind-induced mixing, both in lakes and in the ocean. So there's no multicellular life in Tanganyika below 300 meters, only anaerobic bacteria. But in Baikal, multicellular life inhabits the entire column 
and the deepest parts of the lake floor. But the processes that oxygenate the deep waters of the ocean and by call differ. In the ocean, it is the deep ocean conveyor driven by salty, cold surface water sinking at high latitudes into the deep sea. In Lake Baikal, it is a coastal downwelling process discovered by the Swiss-Russian team. Now, this process is not the spring-fall overturn that occurs in temperate lakes. Coastal downwelling at Baikal occurs in June at ice off and in December before ice on when strong winds cause these cold surface waters perched on top of these warmer waters below to begin moving downwards. And those strong winds mix these cold surface waters down to 300 meters where they would remain, except for the increasing pressure which lowers the temperature of the maximum density of water. And that relationship between pressure and the temperature of the and, and the density of, excuse me, and the temperature of the maximum density of water is plotted on this red dashed line. So going back to our water mass, which is now at 300 meters, this water is now denser than the ambient water. And so this very dense water plunges to the lake floor, maintaining its integrity until it meets the lake floor where it spreads out. Now these oxygen-rich intrusions occur only near shore, not throughout the lake, and they're oxygenating a, more than 12% of the permanent deep water layer each year. And the presence of oxygen in Baikal's deep waters and the lake's geothermal activity help explain the presence of hydrothermal vent communities and chemoautotrophic bacteria on the lake floor. Uh, the chemoautotrophic bacteria in Baikal are methanogens. And sponges in planaria, the white and, and dark large organisms in this photo, use the methanogenic bacteria as food, according to stable isotope analysis. Uh, the marine equivalent, of course, are the vent communities in the ocean, such as this one in the Pacific. Now, still another similarity between Baikal and the oceans is voracious benthic scavengers that devour carcasses. In the oceans, these scavengers are often crabs, isopods, and in shallower waters, lobsters. In Baikal, these scavengers are gamorids, and here's one of the more exotic-looking gamorids, a species that is almost the length of a mouse. This species, however, is not among the renowned scavengers of carcasses, but the gamorid species that are, are so voracious that people living around the lake will tell you that the local Russian mafia prefers to dispose of human bodies in Baikal because nothing's left after two days. Now, my students, of course, were very intrigued by this, and they tested this local legend by deploying traps baited with fish, not humans, along a depth gradient in the lake. And at our captain's urging, we retrieved the traps in less than 48 hours. We wanted to leave them out for, for four to five days, but he convinced us we had to bring them in sooner than that. And we were astounded. There was no fish bait left in at least one-third of the traps, and more than 75% of the bait was gone in the remaining traps. However, each trap was choked with several hundred gamorids. Here they are, two species, mostly this one, which looks just like orzo, uh, the same size, shape, and color. Now, another similarity between Baikal and the oceans is the presence of ice obligates. And these are species that require ice for survival, reproduction, or both. We're all familiar with the polar bear and the penguins in the polar oceans. But ice obligates also inhabit Lake Baikal, and they occupy opposite ends of the pelagic food chain, with the large endemic diatoms at the base and the seal at the top. Now, Lake Baikal's ice is often clear with surprisingly little snow because of a dry winter climate and strong winds that blow that snow off parts of the ice. So sunlight penetrates the ice in March and April, stimulating photosynthesis, 
and warming waters immediately below the ice, setting up vertical convective mixing that keeps these heavy diatoms in suspension where light is optimal uh, for photosynthesis, and they like dim light. Now here you see average algal biomass at Lake Baikal plotted on the y-axis in terms of chlorophyll versus month of the year on the x-axis, and you can clearly see the spring bloom uh, occurring under the ice in April. Uh, this high level of productivity under and in the ice sustains a unique community of organisms that live in the ice. Now, likewise, the Baikal seal requires ice for successful reproduction. Pups are born on the ice in snow ice caves, scratched out by the mother, and, in, and the pups are nursed by the mother for two months before they first enter the water. And these ice caves are very important because they provide a refuge from the pup's major predator, the carrion crow. There are still many other ways in which Baikal functions like an ocean, some of which you see here. Abyssal gigantism, a cryophilic community, bioluminescence, the presence of methane hydrates, and finally, and sadly, coastal eutrophication, uh, which was just recently documented. Clearly, this great lake, like Professor Margalef, is a bridge across the salty divide. Thank you.